start the recording. Hey, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar as part of the 2021 Clinical Trials Methodology course. This is entitled, What Do You Want to Learn? Pearls and Pitfalls When Considering an Early Phase Clinical Trial. Again, these webinars are open to everybody. We do record them. Um, and we also are hoping for your participation through asking questions in the Q&A and, and, and potentially in the chat. So please feel free to put those in as we go and I will work to try to address them. So I would like to acknowledge the funding from NINDS for this course along with support for um, CME and other activities from the American Academy of Neurology. Here are some disclosures for me. I have funding um, from the NIH and I do do some episodic medical legal consulting and I also do some work with Barry Consultants where I am a consultant on some clinical trials um, for industry. All right, what are we gonna try to accomplish today? We want you to consider the purpose of clinical trials, but also consider the purpose of clinical trialists or you as a potential designer and conductor of clinical trials. We wanna consider what the goals are, what, what you try to accomplish with a clinical trial and what you try to accomplish as a clinical trialist. What, what are your goals? Um, want you to understand some potential output of clinical trials, how to ask the questions, and, and how you should be updating your path based on data. So I've got a few section headers in here, and if you have any questions, I will try to address them that you put in the comments box as we go. Um, if we have a really complicated question and you wanna get on audio, we can uh, potentially arrange that. Um, but again, um, please try to type them in as we go along and I will try to address them. But I will, I will pause at each of the section breaks to, to take any accumulated ones I haven't been able to address. All right, so one of the subtitles of this lecture is Pearls and Pitfalls. And I was thinking about pitfalls and it just, reminded me of this uh, very fun Atari game that I used to play called Pitfall. Um, and then when we talked about pearls, we you know, sometimes have, have good truisms in, in clinical trials where it's like, you, know, you should do this, you should do that. We're working to actually amalgamate uh, a list of some of those from, from some of our faculty over the years. But I, I also think that sometimes we, we, we like to kind of clutch our pearls as as more senior clinical trialists when we, we see things that are more in that pitfall space. So I, I've, I'm gonna use these, these pictographs um, as we go to, to, to sort of illustrate some points that, that could be pearls, but then if you don't do them, we, we clutch our pearls or, or things that are pitfalls, areas where people often sort of fall down in, in trial design or in clinical trials in general. So one theme that I think is quite important is to be thinking about the future. And obviously that's something that you hear a lot, but it's more than, than just a theoretical. So if you think forward to about 1 p.m. Eastern, we've wrapped this thing up. I want you to be walking out of this. Um, and again, you may be watching this afterwards you know, this may be a different time, but after you spent, and you may be watching it at double speed on, on, on YouTube, when you're done with this talk, I want you to, to know these things or think about these things. It is essential to get the question right in terms of what you're doing next and why you're doing a clinical trial to make that question useful and get you to the next step. So thinking about the future is important. Thinking about what you would be doing at the end of that clinical trial, looking at the results, depending on what they might be, because you can anticipate they will fall into one of a few sets of scenarios. I want you to be aware of, of myths uh, or pitfalls, like always start with safety when doing clinical trials. Again, you don't want to do things that are unsafe, but a lot of times we are working with things that 
we know are going to be relatively safe or the safety outcomes are going to be relatively rare in relation to the main outcomes. So that's this idea of fast forwarding to the end of the trial and imagine what it's telling you. You should always ask yourself if what you have designed is an underpowered efficacy trial, because then you may need to go back and think about your question. Is there a better question you can be answering? Because typically doing an underpowered efficacy trial is not a good idea, even if somebody tells you that that's what's normally done. When you are at this future phase, standing at the end of your clinical trial or at the next phase of your career, there always must be an option to pivot or stop, to do something different. If what you are doing currently is going to definitely lead to a predetermined next step, then you're missing an opportunity to learn something both for your career and within the clinical trial that you're doing now. So, so the next step always has to have an option where you may need to pivot or stop. If you've designed something that you know is just gonna go to the next step no matter what, you're um, missing a great opportunity to learn. All right, so this is the first part, the prologue. Uh, haven't seen any questions yet, which is reasonable since we haven't, we've talked in very like broad strokes at a very high level. But this is this idea of thinking to the future and, and creating a vision of greatness. Like what is it that you want to learn uh, what is it that will make you feel great about what you've accomplished in your clinical trial and what you've potentially have ac accomplished with a, a, you know, dedicating a few years of your career? So there's a, a very well-regarded restaurant in the Ann Arbor area called Zingerman's. And Ari Weinsweig is the founder of this restaurant. He is a, a noted uh, anarchist, has written many books and um, runs absolutely phenomenal trainings. He was uh, able to talk to us at the University of Michigan mid-career faculty development forum. And it was just a intense pleasure hearing his philosophy and um, you know how one ought to create a vision for oneself. So this type of exercise of visioning of what, what you're gonna be doing next, I'm not gonna propose that I could in a couple minutes on one slide even start to do justice to his idea, his methodology, this arm of his business called Zing Train is entirely focused on, on, on training and development. Although it, it seems like it's more in the business sense of things, really one paradigm for yourselves as many of you are in academics is that you are running a small business to a certain degree and you are the, the sort of star attraction so thinking about yourself from that perspective of, of who are your customers and what where you wanna be is important. Um, and you can also apply that to your clinical trials. Where is it that you are going to go next from that clinical trial and how does the current clinical trial allow you to gather the information to figure out what that next step is? So I, I would highly recommend these, these trainings. Um, there's, there's freely available content, there's books. Um, Again, I, I don't get a discount on their sandwiches or anything else, but it really is um, helpful stuff. And even though it, it sort of lies outside, perhaps the, the typical career development type stuff for uh, people in the biomedical sciences. So as you go through this, one of these sort of overall themes that I want you to think about that, I, that I've alluded to already is thinking about these two tracks. What is the information that your current trial is gonna provide that helps science or helps patients or helps design the next trial? But also you should be thinking about this from the perspective of what information is this trial providing to you as a scientist who is looking to develop their career and figure out what gives you meaning and what will keep you engaged and enjoying your work, but also accomplishing great things with your work. So as you design clinical trials, you know, part of it is experiential, but part of it is also, you know, getting to the next scientific answer. So I think thinking about things from both perspectives, how will you grow as a part of this trial and how will you grow scientific understanding? 
and what are the outputs you know on both tracks what is the scientific output of the trial what is that data going to tell you as i said you have to have a pathway as to what happens next are you going to change practice with the information from that is it that that really and you know sort of pivotal trial um, most uh, of you are, are sort of more at the stage where you're designing those pre-pivotal trials and how is it going to help get you to the next step um, but also is it going to give you better information as to whether you want to continue to make clinical trials part of your academic portfolio and part of your career and I think you should also have a way of, of continuing to assess that and whether it is a good fit for you and whether you're you, you need to do something different. So I think you should always be collecting data on these sort of two tracks. You know, is this good for science and patients? And is this good for you? And one result of each of these experiences absolutely has to be that the data that you collect must have the possibility of changing your future actions. If it doesn't, then you've designed something wrong, whether it's how you're evaluating your career or whether how it's you've, you've set up the questions in your clinical trial. So I think you really need to think about this. A lot of times we may just sort of move from one step to the next step without thinking, what would make me want to change? And I think it's not easy, but it, it's important. And it's a little easier for the clinical trials to a certain degree um, than it is for your career because the career is a little bit less linear then i'm going to answer the scientific question and do this next but i do think you should be thinking about it in parallel what what is it that you want to be doing next and it's not an easy question if you if you were to ask me what do i want to be doing in five years i i don't have as good an answer as i would like either um so we can all do do a bit better with this and i think when we do it, it helps guide us and give us more purpose all right so moving into the less abstract clinical trials themselves and the scope of the problem clinical trials can sometimes stink this is a stink bug we have a fair number of these in michigan they like my garage for some reason um these are some of the reasons that clinical trials stink um number one they are um hold on one second i'm giving a live presentation can you um, I, I can't help you right now no i can't i can't help you right now okay hello dad's co-workers the, the, this is 73 uh presenter people who are looking at this from across the country I'm uh, famous. you're famous that's andrew moyer thank you um so clinical trials stink to a certain degree because sometimes we don't think about them using the right lens. What we should really be thinking of a clinical trial is, is not necessarily something that is going to just move us to the next step. Like I need to do this clinical trial because I'm sure this treatment works. I just need to tell everybody else that it works. So like give me my grant so I can write my paper and tell everybody else this works. Clinical trials are an opportunity to explore what treatments might work. And it, it, they're more like diagnostic tests. They're going to have a false positive rate. They're gonna have a true positive rate. And these are the types of errors a, a clinical trial can make, but we are screening for things that are effective treatments. Um, we are not, we don't know those answers. That's why we're doing the clinical trials. So, we, but, but it's complicated. We have to make a ton of guesses at the beginning and, and or, or make assumptions because if we really don't know anything, um, we don't know where to start. So common assumptions are that we, we've got the dose relatively right, that the effect isn't heterogeneous across different types of patients or, or subgroups that, um, we don't even want to put in some subgroups because we don't think they'll get better, but, but sometimes we don't have a really great biological reason for that. We know how much money we can typically get within a grant, um, and oftentimes our effect sizes will be bounded by that. So we would say it's, it's clinically relevant to improve mortality from 
20% to 10%. That's a huge effect size. You're, you're halving mortality. There's, there's not that many game-changing treatments out there, but that may be what you're going to say is clinically meaningful, even if a decrease in mortality from 20% to 18% would be very meaningful because it's um, you know, a relatively common disease. We think that we can understand the noise and the outcomes, but it's, it's hard for us to quantify and understand what that noise means. Um, we think that maybe the duration of the treatment's practical, but again, sometimes it would be, sometimes it won't. I do a lot of acute treatments, um, but you know, the length of the, the treatment is, um, is quite meaningful. So we look at a lot of these things, but we, we do some data reduction here to make the number of parameters in this model solvable. And that the more of these things we could answer with data, the better. But at some level, you do have to use what information you have biologically and in the literature from both human studies or animal studies, or in, in terms of behavioral interventions, other foundational work or theory to get your clinical trial to the next step as to an idea on paper. And thinking of it another way, there, are, there is this sort of biological truth out there that there is some relationship between what you are doing, your treatment regimen, whether it will benefit patients, but which patients it will benefit based on the prognostic factors. And the benefit, the therapeutic response service surface can, can go below zero, right? Some treatments could be helpful in some patients and harmful in others. But the idea is, as we do clinical trials, we're trying to learn about this surface, at least at some combination of, you know, regimens, whether it's dose, and at some combination of prognostic factors based on the, the type of disease and the type of patients with that disease. So this is what we are searching through. Obviously, it's hard to, without tons and tons of data, to fit this, this three-dimensional plane. Um, so we focus in on part of it to, to see if that, you know, a couple of those uh, dimensions are in that benefit space and, and who benefits and at, at what dose or at what regimen. All right. So again, I don't see any questions yet, which is okay. But if you start to have questions, please feel free to type them in. Okay, that's a good question. So how do you learn about this curve when you assume subjects respond to the intervention similarly? Where does that assumption take place? So one of the things that, you know, I, I could sort of use an example and we would say that, do patients respond to TPA differently based on their baseline level of severity or the anatomic lesion of their clot. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you know or, or do people with small vessel clots or occlusion do differently than people with large vessel occlusion? And we learn about that as we go along. Um, in the original trial, they did some subgroup analyses didn't see major heterogeneity of effect across those, but sort of different intercepts. If you have a big clot in your um, distal ICA, you're likely to have a bigger stroke. And if you have a bigger stroke, it may be harder to get to a, a near perfect outcome, a zero or one on the modified Rankin scale. So part of it is not that you're designing your trial to actually address all of the potential situations, but you're understanding what trade-offs you're making, um, whether they're trade-offs with respect to prognosis or whether they're trade-offs with respect to um, you know, where you can learn the most. One other trade-off is sometimes age, right? Like I think in, in the European stroke trials, they had a max age of 80 because they, they thought that the, the baseline risk of disability was so high. But the other studies and, and ongoing work showed that even people over 80 continued to benefit from reperfusion, um, but their baseline risk of, of a poor outcome was greater. So, you know, that's, you know, those are, those are a couple of the, the, the sort of dynamics that, that kind of come in terms of trying to learn more about that curve. You know, what's the right population? 
Um, and, and sometimes an approach is to start with a population that you think is most likely to really respond well, and then work to um, move out from there in future studies, you know, to develop that, that the, if the treatment works in a subset, then um, it's easier to look at it in, in a larger number of patients. The example there I would say is some of the more um, recent extended window reperfusion trials in um, ischemic stroke or large vessel ischemic stroke in that, you know, at some mismatch uh, ratio, patients tend to benefit quite a bit, but um, future studies are needed and are ongoing, you know, there's ongoing plans for it is because there was so much benefit in the using the, the initial set of parameters that were that were sort of set out there to define how much core versus how much infarct. Um, additional studies are, are needed to look to see if maybe people with more core could still benefit. There's, there's, there's tissue to be saved. So how much core is too much core? So that's, that's an ongoing question to answer afterwards. Another way is to try to reduce the variability that is um, being, and this is a good, this is a good point um, from uh, Dr. Alka um, in that you can also address differences in baseline prognosis for by adjusting for it. Um, you know, the the Boost trial did does this. The the Shine trial and Stroke did this in terms of using a sliding dichotomy depending on how severe you presented, there's a different bar for what would be judged a success in the trial, at least on a binary outcome. So that's another approach to, you know, the, the, the underlying concept to this is increasing the amount each patient tells you in the trial, how, how many patients are, are giving you meaningful answers with respect to their outcomes in terms of how well the treatment works. So those are, those are good points. All right, so here we go with a weird question. How do you recommend we determine an end game to our study? If we are doing a pilot study of an innovative treatment paradigm with little risk, then should we be trying to figure out now if a certain organizations would be willing to buy out this program you have created? Um, yeah, it is a little bit of a weird question, um, but I do think the, the real goal is pre-setting go, no-go criteria. Like what, you know, even if they are, um, even if you know, the, the, the emphasis here is on having some quantitative bar for success. Now, sometimes this may feel arbitrary. Like uh, one example was a pilot trial I did of text messaging for hypertension in the emergency department, where we thought it would be reasonable if we, um, we gave blood pressure cuffs to people, sent them home with them and texted them. We thought it would be reasonable if we, if about half the people texted us back. Not exactly half the people, um, because we were only enrolling 100 people. So we 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 drew a 95% confidence interval around half with a sample size of 100, and said, if we're not, you know, if not that, if less than this number of people are texting us back and are still hypertensive, then maybe we need to adjust our approach. Maybe we need to enroll people with a larger NIH, your a larger blood pressure while in the emergency department, et cetera. And I think the more you can actually set the goalposts at the beginning, as opposed to, hey, we're gonna do a cool study and you know, we'll look at 45 outcome measures and you know, we'll sort of see if there's something exciting that could 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 spur some more investment. Or interest, and you know, and in, in in either case, whether investments from private investors or whether investments like writing the next grant to get uh, NIH reviewers excited about doing the next thing, I think you know, setting the the right types of question to answer, and I'll get into this um, through the the future slides, just in terms of some of the potential types of questions you could ask. So um, there's another question, which is a good question. Like, should you use strict go, no go criteria for defining success and moving to a later phase trial or would be preferred to implement a more probabilistic and stochastic approach? So it depends on what sort of question you're trying to answer. If you don't know much about how well your treatment works and, what the, and you don't know much about how that population might respond on that outcome measure, 
um, it may be hard to set a strict go no go criteria and what you're interested in learning about more is the variability in the outcomes. I think it is um, generally though to say a big problem to say that I'm going to do this small study to figure out what effect size is feasible for the next study. Um, because a small sample size estimate is more unstable than a large sample size estimate. Now there may be some ways that you could do that in a clever way if it's a continuous outcome and you really don't know the variability in that outcome after you start adding in a new treatment. You're going to learn more about that standard deviation that variability and that can help you understand better the noise and may help you understand where the next trial should 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 range. Um, sometimes people will use things called futility designs so that when you're within a zone of potential promise, things will move on. Um, you know, that, that would, I think, maybe be more what you're getting at in terms of a probabilistic approach. So yeah, not necessarily saying, I have to have 50% of patients have a good outcome on the modified Rankin to succeed. But, you know, if they're, if they're within this range that there is a decent probability, there may be a benefit with this, that is a way to go. Um, they're a little bit more complicated, but there are ways to sort of say, estimate what the probability that you have some effect size is, you know, using a Bayesian trial. You know, is there at least a 50% probability that there's a 10% or more improvement in mortality? So those are all, those are other good ways to, to potentially set bars in the right situations. So most people are familiar with uh, how trials can move through phases. This is tilted towards drug trials. And obviously we are interested in both or in drug trials, device trials, intervention trials. Um, but it's, it's a long process involving many steps. Um, oftentimes in academia, we may be in the phase um, two space uh, potentially, or we're looking at new treatments. Um, sometimes in the phase one, one space. Phase three for new, mo mo new molecules or new agents. Typically this is funded by industry, but there may be certain cases where we're doing um, repurposed drugs where we're, we're, we're in the kind of completely academic space, even in phase three. Um, so these are, again, looking at this kind of from the perspective of new molecule, but also looking at this from another perspective. Again, these are the four phases of development within each study, kind of developing the objectives, design, conduct, analysis, and report. But thinking about, are you in an exploratory phase, confirmatory phase, or have you moved on to therapeutic use and learning more about how the treatment works in uh, real life? All right, so those were, that was that, that last phase the phases, again, they don't naturally map to the same sorts of phases for device trials, but again, you know, are you in an exploratory space or are you in more of a pivotal space? And I think that also resonates with uh, behavioral interventions and other types of studies. So when you're crafting a clinical trial question, some features of good ones is that your trial should generally have one main question. Um, this may drive your decision-making for what happens next. It will give people the most sort of unambiguous takeaway from your study. And it makes it uh, easier to plan as you, as you have this to focus on. It's not to say you might not be collecting some additional information about things, but I think you have to be cautious and, and know that you may not be able to learn much about some of the secondary outcomes because you'll be pretty underpowered on them. But you know, is, is X better than Y? Pretty simple question. But um, oftentimes in the early space, you're, you're not ready to ask that question. Um, but it does need to be more specific. Does X improve when measuring this specific outcome in this population for this long at this dose? So can you make the question better? You, know, you start with a question. Um, Best to keep it simple and work on, on making it better, but what, what dose schedule and population would hold the most promise for determining that X can be proven to be better than Y in a future phase three trial? This is more the probabilistic approach of, you know, can we, can we establish this in the next step? So 
oftentimes you're asking a good question, um, but you got to be careful that you might be asking too many questions at once. And, and you have to be honest about what's going to help you move forward. And, uh, you know, you might be like, well, what are the risks of getting the question wrong or a little wrong? And, uh, you know, the, the regulators, what they worry about is we could falsely declare that some drug is efficacious. And then we're exposing a bunch of people to that, but it's not doing what we hope it, hoped it would do. As academics, there's other potential worries. Um, and I think probably the top one here is the most worrisome that by making um, less than stellar choices in the early phase trials, you might, um, come to a design for your pivotal trial where you show that something is neutral, even if it would have been effective had you done the clinical trial differently and focused on a different dose, different population, and so forth. So that, to me, that's, that's what I worry about, that we didn't, that, that it will be hard to rehabilitate that treatment because we got something wrong. We needed to give the drug longer. We needed to give it earlier. Um, Definitely going back to the stroke examples that I often do, you know, the NINDS TPA trial enrolling half of its patients in under 90 minutes really contributed to a good estimation of the, the treatment effect that was um, not particularly ambiguous. Uh, whereas the concurrent trials in Europe were enrolling most of the patients towards the end of the treatment windows at, at six hours um, and, and presented somewhat different results at that time. So I think. Um, you have to think about the risks of getting something wrong based on the biology and then propagating that to the next trial just because your early phase trial was randomly positive. So getting the population dose and schedule right is, is important. You know, again, reiterate this point, the, um, are you in a learning phase? Are you in a confirming phase? And in the learn phase, you can be um, more flexible potentially in terms of the number of questions and the goals. Um, there can be a little bit higher error rates, uh, but you don't wanna set these up as underpowered confirmatory trials. In the confirm phase, you have to be much more rigid in terms of the control of error rates have a good pre-specification of your single primary outcome and the hypothesis underlying it. And this is often the setting for the, the more typical one-to-one -one randomized RCT. And interestingly, these can be easier to plan if you have the right preliminary data, simply because you have a lot of sample size to work with. So, so many of the other quirks that are a problem when you are only working with a smaller number of patients um, start to go away. Now, if you got some things wrong in those early phase trials, like regimen or population or so forth, then um, the phase three trial, uh, maybe you may be able to compensate for that somewhat in the design, but usually not too much. So it's, that, that's why those foundational studies are important. Let me just look through this point here. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. All right, so here are some questions that are kind of, I, we have about eight to go through as things that often can be good early phase clinical trial questions, but, but sometimes there's a pitfall. So one is, can the drug be tolerated? And for new drugs, this may be a legitimate question. Um, a lot of times we're working with drugs that have been used in, in, in different populations and many drugs, because they have gotten through phase one studies and so forth, just end up being pretty tolerable. So if, you're, if your goal is to see, see if vitamin C is tolerable in stroke patients, since it was tolerable in all other humans, um, you're wasting an opportunity to actually answer an important question because we can just say, yep, it'll be tolerable in stroke patients because there's not really a biological reason to think that vitamin C isn't going to be tolerable in stroke patients. Now, if there is a biological reason, you know, it may be important to address this. It may be more noxious for, for stroke patients for some reason, but you have to strongly justify that. So 
that's something that we look out for when we're, we're thinking about applications to the clinical trials methodology course. Is this question one that is, is pretty, you know, it's like, okay, yes, we know, we, we know the answer pretty much. Um, there's not a lot of uncertainty there. So you're not reducing uncertainty. So it's unlikely that you're going to know something new after you finish the trial than before. Um, so, so that's something to be careful about that tolerability studies can be quite important. Now in, in other, other settings, if it's a chronic treatment versus an acute treatment, tolerability is quite different. If you have to take a drug every day um, and it messes up your liver, that's, that can be a big problem. Or if you vomit profusely after taking it each day, you're not gonna keep taking it. Whereas it's, a, it's an acute treatment for a really terrible disease, and sometimes it transiently bumps your liver function tests, that's you know, maybe a completely different situation. So, so, so tolerated, you know, is it tolerated is, is, can be an important question, but you have to think about what you're learning in that space. Proof of concept. Now, this is like, I'm clutching my pearls a little here because I think the right sorts of proof of concept goals can be one of the best ways to think about early phase clinical trials. But the, the devil is in the details in that we don't often um, know enough about the real mechanism of the drug, target engagement, a lot of these other things to actually do as good a job as we potentially could with this sort of question of proof of concept. That being said, legitimate proof of concept that is believable by the scientific community and well premised can be one of the best approaches to early phase trials. Because if you know, you're studying a new drug and you really wanna know if it gets into the brain of humans, um, and you have a study to, to establish whether it does or doesn't, you know, if it needs to affect the brain, it needs to get into the brain. So th that may be establishing that you can get into the brain and stick to the, the markers or molecules that it needs to can be a crucial first step because nothing else is going to work downstream if it doesn't, unless it has some other totally different mechanism that you weren't thinking of, which would be sort of too bad, um, not implausible sometimes that things are pleiotropic, but, but again, proof of concept can be, can be a good question, but it, it's a hard question to construct because there's usually layers upon layers of uncertainty um, about what's going on with the drug. So, so something to, to, to think about, but be careful with. Um, what doses should be investigated further? This is also a question I, or dose or doses, it's a question I typically love, but it gets to some of the other, you know, that first proof of concept question. Have you already saturated all the receptors? But are you sure those are the receptors that drive the actual mechanism of this treatment? And I think, you know, this doesn't just apply to drugs like therapy, like how much physical therapy can you do in a day? Um, does it, you know, at what, what point do the muscles need to rest and, and, and so forth? but could you speed recovery? I'm recovering from a shoulder injury and I could not move my shoulder against gravity last week. Um, but now I can lift it up. It's slow, it's slow, but I've got my NIH stroke scale left arm down from um, about a three to about a one or zero in the past week. So, so that's good. Um, but how, mu how, mu how many minutes a day was I doing exercise and what's the right amount? you know, if I do too much, my muscles get all tired and I get sore and then I don't exercise as much the next day. So uh, there can be important things to learn about how to dose things and whether more of your stuff is better than less of your stuff, but it also can be complicated. Um, and, you know, this is also one of those things where <laughs> thinking to the future about anticipated regret, like if you were to do your trial and you're sitting there, you know, Five years later, your trial's done, you finished your R01 or your K23, and you saw that your stuff didn't work. If you know, if you say, well, what would I do next? And if, if what you say is, what would I do next? I would use a larger dose. 
then why didn't you do that the first time? You know, why, you know, why didn't you set something up so that you could be looking at more doses if the doses are generally well tolerated? What's the evidence for your current dose and why not make it bigger? Um, so I think having good answers to those questions and like sometimes people who have the answer of, well, that's a dose we always gave in these other conditions. And it's like, okay, but is that, what's the science behind that, right? What molecules is it sticking to? What, what you know, if you're like, this is just as, you know, as much that the protein in the body combined, it doesn't go any higher. I have good PK data to say that this, this is really like the max dose. Like it can't have activity over and above that. Like, okay, again, I'm not going to be able to vet your fact check you on every one of those things. But I think you should be very cautious with, when you, you're sort of setting a dose and it's and your, your, your main answer is just because, or this is what they did in another study. Figure out why they did it at that dose in the other study. Keep, keep going backwards and, and trying to look at to, to be able to really justify your dose. And, and if you would be sad if your study didn't show an effect, could you give a bigger dose? And what, what are the reasons you couldn't? If there's good reasons not to, and you're like, Hey, my study doesn't work at this dose. I'm I'm good. I'm going to move to the next type of drug, or next type of treatment. Then then good. Um, what outcome should be measured in your study? This is a hard question. I'm not going to even really try to answer it here. You have to think about whether that's a good question for an early phase design. It's probably. Um, Probably not. You have to answer it to design it. Um, but you know, we have more talks that that more focus on outcome later in the course. I'm I'm just not even going to go here much, other than choosing how your outcome measure should be in the next trial. There's other important areas of uncertainty, like if you have four hours of neurocognitive and vestibular testing, and None of your patients come back to, to do all that. That may be a signal that you, know, you, you need to have a simpler outcome measure or so, you know, something like that. So, so some of it can also tri trigger towards patient burden and what are patients willing to learn. And, and perhaps for some rare diseases, people would be excited about doing four hours of, of cognitive and vestibular testing, but you just have to think about, are, are they gonna have the energy to do it depending on your disease of study? Um, what disease state should be studied? This is, you know, uh, important um, because it, you know, deals again with what are the, how much has the disease progressed? What are the patients like? Um, what are the established outcome measures? Sometimes you could be doing phase two trial. People could be working on phase two trials in two concurrent spaces. Um, sometimes you may be doing this in a, a sort of coordinated way through an indication fi finding trial, which is complicated using a integrated statistical approach. This is a pitfall because I think sometimes we make assumptions and are, we have these sort of two competing interests and we have to be really cautious. One interest is in making a treatment that's as accessible to as many patients as possible. That is a compelling interest. And, you know, the whole field of effectiveness research is couched on this. Like, why should we study things that we can only use in a small, carefully um, curated subset of people? The other boundary of that is there's much, 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 much more noise when you focus on a large swath of the population of people with disease and an approach that is sort of on the other end of we're not just studying this very discrete group only because we're we, we don't think it will work in the others but this is the group in whom we think it will work the most and within the the resources of our, our smaller earlier study taking our best shot at the people who we think we have the best shot of showing decent sized detectable difference in can be a very reasonable approach and could lead you to tune down the number of, of eligible patients. Now, if your disease is relatively rare and you're, you know, let's say you want to do acute stroke study and you want to limit people to, you know, age 40 to 50 with an NIH stroke scale of six to nine, you're really turning down your number of eligible patients. And then it's going to be pretty hard to finish that study because those, those, enrollment criteria are so narrow. So there's also that, 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 that um, barrier that you're gonna run up against is, 
if you have good biologic reasons to tune down your population, go for it, but know that it's going to make your trial longer. You might need more centers or it may just, um, you know, introduce a lot of problems. So where you get that balance, it depends, but you have to think about it as a set of trade-offs. Um, you know, this is kind of continuing to say that, you know, whether we were narrow or broad, but you do want to be doing the same type of, if you're moving on to a confirmatory study, you know, you, you may be finding the groups that are most likely to respond in your learn phase study. That's that could be reasonable, but it needs to be carefully pre-specified and carefully thought about. You shouldn't do um, a set of, of post hoc uh, unplanned analyses to design the phase three trial. Um, you may need to learn about the logistics of the, of the future study and, and how the analysis should work. There are um, important questions that you may be able to gather data on in this space. So there, there are early phase questions that help think about the design and implementation. Maybe if this is a study that is looking at randomization of cardiac arrest victims in the field, you may need a learn phase study to show how to do this, how to make it feasible and what the, what the problems are. And one of the questions, again, this, this gets at that, that prior question about firm go, no go uh, criteria, should you be doing the next study at all? Or what should that next study look like? Should you be going back to the confirmatory space? Should you be going to the confirmatory space or should you know, do you need a different exploratory study, a different treatment, um, more treatments? So we really want to focus the confirmatory trial space on things that have a reasonable chance of showing benefit. Um, but in some diseases, you know, I could say traumatic brain injury or Alzheimer's disease, we um, have, have such a, a track record of, of not showing things that, you know, you know, perhaps the bar is lower because, you know, when you're getting the first treatment, it's, it, it can be a little, little harder to find that, that first thing. But, you know, one approach is, to, as we talked about, set it up as what is the probability that um, you could be successful in the next trial based on the results on your main outcome in this trial? And is it sufficiently high? Um, is, it, is it over 50%? We know that probably only 20% of neuroscience-based trials, depending on the disease, actually show uh, benefit in the confirmatory space. So if you, if you do an early phase design that says you have a greater than 50% chance of success, you've doubled the chances. And um, you could say, but every grant that goes in for a confirmatory study says that it's 90% powered. And again, this is different, right? Like the, the power calculation has a lot of assumptions in it. And we know that 90% of trials do not show a positive outcome. These are, these are different parameters. All right, so I think at this point, I got just a couple wrap up slides. So I, I would encourage folks to enter questions as, as we go here, just through the, the, the sort of takeaways and epilogue. Um, and I will continue to try to answer them for you as they come in. Um, all right, so the like the really early part of the epilogue in terms of something that's a, a random practical thought as you're designing a clinical trial, I really would encourage you to look at uh, the equator network and the, the consort extensions. There's consort extensions for pilot and feasibility trials, N of one trials, pragmatic trials, um, non-pharmacologic intervention trials. And looking through these, which would be the checklist, this is, this is along that theme of looking to the future. You're writing up the paper of your clinical trial. Did you do all the steps that are gonna be required as of the reporting guidelines? So looking at the reporting guidelines in your design phase, really important so that you make sure that you, you build all the stuff into your trial that you need to have so that it's transparent um, and potentially reproducible if people were to use a, a similar protocol. So, so think about these consort extensions as helpful guidelines and, and sort of uh, 
guardrails as to how to potentially design your early phase trial when there's an appropriate extension. So this we, we went over before, but I'm going to remind you of the takeaways. Getting the question right is essential. It's not easy, takes some thought, but it's time well spent um, in the, you know, the idea of uh, attributed to, to General Dwight Eisenhower. Plans are useless, but planning is essential. So this is the, this idea of, it may take you some time to get to the right question, but that, that planning time is very, very helpful. Beware of myths that you may hear, like we, we must establish safety first, because in certain cases, things do have to be not unsafe, but the estimation of rare events, um, you know, for example, um, thrombocytopenic clotting after a vaccine, are simply going to be perhaps important risks, but so infrequent relative to main outcomes, such as prevention of an infectious disease, that you're not going to be able to exclude them within the smaller sample sizes of your exploratory phase trials. So, so don't try. Those will be examples of asked and answered type early phase questions. Um, the other takeaway is to fast forward to the end of your trial, stand on the ground there looking at the results and imagine what it's saying and what, what you would be doing next and what you'd be telling others in the scientific community to do next. And also what you might be doing next with your career at that point. Always ask yourself if this is an underpowered efficacy trial. And as you reach that crossroads of thinking of the future, done with my trial, pivot, or go or, or run away screaming must always be an option. Um, that, that data that you're looking at at the end, it has to motivate you and it has to have the ability to help you change course. If, you're, if you know what the next step is gonna be, it's quite hard. Now, I do totally appreciate that in the, in the K23 space or the K08 space or, or, off, or even in, in you know, or, early stage investigators first R01, you do have to offer value and you do need to learn something. And, and learning that treatment X just doesn't work is likely not enough to, to have that be an exciting grant. So you have to be concurrently learning about whether it's the epidemiology or the natural history of the disease, but you have to be arriving at an answer that's gonna be scientifically interesting no matter what, but that also has the ability to be different. If you know what the answer is gonna be before you do the study, you're missing an opportunity to learn. Important in the, the space of looking at trials at NINDS and across NIH is the rigor of the scientific background, something that is very um, emphasized amongst grant reviewers is as they are looking at the existing research that you're using to justify your current trial, how rigorously was it done, you know, and Again, you do have to provide some um, frank discussion about the, the advantages and disadvantages of, and key knowledge gaps that exist in that, in that, in that uh, sort of corpus of pre-existing information about your disease. So be sure to look at those uh, rigor and transparency guidelines from NINDS um, when you are you know, thinking about your treatments and thinking about your grant applications. They are, they are quite important. I think with that, I will open it up to any um, final questions. Um, certainly, you all can email me. Um, my email is wmeurer at umich.edu. Um, you can find me on Twitter. It's Will Moyer. Um, and um, with that, I managed to finish six minutes early, which is, I was aiming for 10, but. But yeah, with that, I mean, I think um, at this point, I'll hang out here for a couple additional minutes, but I think for those, the rest of you who, who may have something else to do at one Eastern, you know, thank you for your attention today. And again, for those who are in the course this year, um, you know, 
hopefully this will, will help give you some additional guidance as you go forward. For those of you who are thinking about doing clinical trials in the future, already been doing clinical trials, um, hope, hopefully this orientation helps you think about how you get to those questions for your early phase trials. Well, there's a question in the Q&A. How do statisticians pivot or stop? I don't know. I'd almost like to see what, what Chris Coffey has to say about that since I'm only a, uh, I only have a master's in biostatistics. So he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a more official statistician if he's willing to answer. If not, I can try. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I, I guess it depends. Do you mean in the context of a trial? I mean, it would <clears throat> really just be building in as part of the design, the rules in advance of what would lead to early stopping or the decision to not go forward. Yeah, and I think this is one of the, one of the things that we definitely encourage as part of our course, but also has been a essential element of the trial networks that I've been involved in is helping the having the biostatisticians and clinician leaderships of trials think very frankly about those things as to what is what does success look like? What does ambiguity look like, and and helping to draw those those boundaries? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean there's always early stopping rules, but um, you know I, I think that the myasthenia trial from Neuronex gave very clear: if we are in these zones, here's what the next step is in terms of um, what how we would interpret this and where we would go forward. So I think. A lot of that is just good collaboration between the biostatisticians and the clinicians, really looking at, at each other as um, equal scientific partners. All right, so uh, Dr. Gutman has a, a good point. What do you do if it fails? Um, you know, do you go back and see what the failure was? How do you address it or avoid it? And I would say failure is sort of an interesting concept. Not showing a significant difference between two treatments is not necessarily a failure. In a, in a confirmatory phase trial, it could provide clear evidence that perhaps a more expensive or more intensive intervention is not worthwhile. Um, in the early phase space, you know, not, not achieving your objective or, or showing that your treatment is feasible, showing that your treatment is within some zone of promise, having a plan for what contributed to that, you know, if it's a text messaging trial, how many people stopped texting you? That may have been, you know, what, what's the underlying variable that's driving? People can't respond to an intervention if they're not continuing to get it. So is it an adherence, engagement? So I think thinking about the components of, of what success would have looked like and if there are measures that you could take to improve the delivery of your intervention in the future trial. So, but it may be that you maximize delivery and things still didn't work. So that might be, you might have a different way that you would move forward after that. All right. Well, thank you all for your ongoing attention and really good questions. Um, we will uh, adjourn for today and look forward to, to seeing you all in, in future talks. And please make sure to evaluate the webinar. And the link yes. is in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.